Amendment that everybody has in front of them, I believe, that you and the state's attorneys worked on? Yes, sir. I am. Um, we have witnesses scheduled who could then comment on that. James is on the way. Huh? Pepper's on the way. Good. All right. Good. So we have we have really gutted this bill in terms of any additional funding. You know, which the original was uh, three years old on people. Correct. Uh, for the record, Morning Fox, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. Uh, I'd like to start by saying you know, thank you to the committee and to the chair. Uh, I want to repeat what I've said at the beginning of almost each and every testimony around this bill, uh, which has been to say thank you for introducing this bill. Uh, this is a discussion that has been uh, long needed, uh, and it's been my pleasure to be a part of this, this conversation uh, and getting this bill to the point where it is now. Uh, uh, as uh, the chair mentioned, uh, We've had conversations with uh, state's attorneys as well as alleged counsel uh, in trying to provide some uh, further input on uh, the language. Um, we wanted to thank uh, Eric. Uh, your work on this has been uh, tremendous, and thank you for your patience uh, as we've been working around numerous uh, illnesses in our department trying to uh, come up with the language and finally get it to you and uh, get it in, in front of the committee for today's uh, testimony. Um, Interestingly enough, um, the language in here, uh, I can kind of go over again if that would be helpful for the yeah. committee. Um, and so uh, some of the, the specific provisions that, that we had looked for uh, to have included in, uh, in this uh, bill, just give me a second as I'm trying to reorient myself to this the first time I'm actually looking at it on paper. Um, but uh, uh, the basic tenets are of, of the different things that I testified to uh, last week uh, have all been incorporated into this version, um, including uh, some of the following. Um, the uh, idea that uh, competency and sanity evaluations are now to be separated, uh, that if there is a competency and sanity uh, question, that the competency evaluation uh, would take place uh, first and that sanity evaluations uh, would only take place once uh, competency has been established or that the evaluator uh, feels that they ha can have a finding of uh, competence uh, to stand trial. Uh, and this would help, uh, I believe, with Vermont in becoming more in line with uh, uh, the best practices throughout, throughout the nation um, uh, in regards to that. Um, this, uh, this language also uh, includes, uh, where am I going with this? Um, the uh, party status uh, that uh, the department had requested when competency and sanity uh, is requested, uh, or that sanity and competency have been raised as an issue, uh, that uh, the Department of Mental Health and the Vermont uh, Legal Aid Mental Health Law Project uh, shall become parties uh, uh, to these cases. Uh, again, uh, as uh, the Attorney General's Office for the Department of Mental Health and the Mental Health Law Project are the folks who really truly understand some of the ins and outs of uh, our mental health system, uh, the needs of individuals, and can speak to those needs uh, most appropriately uh, going through in, uh, in the court cases. Um, I can continue as long as, unless there are questions. Uh, well, currently the department's not a party. Currently, the department is not a party uh, in criminal cases, and part of the issue is that uh, at times uh, there may be uh, questions as to uh, once a decision of competency or sanity has been determined, uh, the next step in the process is to go to a hospitalization hearing where they determine whether a person should be ordered hospitalized or placed on maybe an order of non-hospitalization. Uh, and. It happens that uh, at times the department is notified of an order of hospitalization that we were not a party to or not aware of. Uh, and there are times that uh, um, 
uh, and significant times where we've had some strong disagreements with uh, the, the court's decision in that and had no ability to uh, to express that those concerns or the, the clinical concerns that might indicate that a person was actually not appropriate for hospitalization. Uh, and especially in light of limited resources in psychiatric uh, inpatient facilities, we're looking to ensure that the folks who are uh, ordered to an inpatient uh, facility truly actually need to be uh, in an inpatient psychiatric facility. Morgan, I'm looking at the bottom of page two, the top of page three. Yes, sir. If I go before a judge and I have a client who we are questioning whether they were sane at the time of the event, but there's nothing about my relationship with that individual that leads me to say, Judge, I don't think this person is competent. I would only be asking for a sanity evaluation. This language specifically says that the examination of sanity shall only be undertaken if the person is determined to be competent first. Do you really want to go through the expense and the time of a competency evaluation if that issue hasn't been raised? I don't think it was our intent that to, to have language that, that uh, one would have to go through a competency evaluation. Um, I think our intent uh, with the language was that the, the evaluator had no, no questions about it. There was no questions, so they would just continue on with, their, with the sanity piece. Um, yeah. It's possible maybe we can make some it is you know, wording language changes. It is able to form the opinion. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> presumes that he's conducting an evaluation of competence. And the way this is designed, that issue would have to be a separate court hearing right. from the actual target, which is the sanity evaluation. Right. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, it it was just the way that comes out. That could be yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe Karen could. Sorry, yeah, if I may. Uh, Karen Margaret, General Counsel for the Department. Actually, if you look up at the top of page two, um, it talks about examinations um, shall have reference to one or both. So it does talk about how you could only have a sanity or only have a competency if that's the only issue. And then if you look at the section I think you're talking about, it is talking about if this psychologist or psychiatrist has been asked to provide opinions on both. And so I think that's when that would play in, um, come into effect. But the, um, the statute does actually talk about only being um, able to order one of them if that's, what, if that's what's being requested. So we do think the language covers it, but certainly we can continue to work with Ledge Council if you have concerns. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Yeah. so, if I'm understanding it right, then maybe a tweak, which may address Senator Bang's point, is that <coughs> find 17, page 2, Uh, if the psychiatrist or psychologist has been asked to provide opinions as to both, right, as to both the person's competency and the person's sanity, and then you could say at the beginning of the second <coughs> sentence, uh, line 20, page 2, in such cases, the examination of the sanity shall only be undertaken. Mm -hmm. Is that right? So that, that links them yeah. up. So that, mm -hmm. that way there wouldn't be the situation that Senator Bain described. Yeah. yeah, that does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we'd be good with that as well. But it still makes it two separate. You first determine whether a person is competent. If there's a question for that. If there's a question yes. about that, and then whether or not they're saying it. Yes. it seems to make sense to me. We can, we'll hear from other witnesses that it might not have been. And Pepper, you can jump. You kind of came late to the party, but you know, you feel free to jump in here. I know you and and uh, Morning Warp on this. Right. Yeah. I missed the sorry, James Pepper, Department State Attorney, Chair. I missed the question, but if the, the question. Bottom of page two. The only thing that the psychologist is able to form the opinion that the defendant's competent to stand trial. The issue is if I have a client who I am interacting with and I have no indication that this person is in <coughs> I wouldn't ask for a competency evaluation. But if there's a question about what their brain was like at the time of the event, I would be asking for a sanity evaluation. I don't understand why you would even need the impression that a competency evaluation should take place first right. in a separate court proceeding before you can get to the actual target of what the problem is. And that was our exact concern with that provision as well. Um, it sounds like 
we, we would be supportive of the change. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so some of the other language uh, that, that we've worked on that we had asked to add in uh, is actually later on in the bill, uh, part of the uh, forensic study uh, piece uh, where it talks about uh, uh, that part of the study would, would look at uh, um, different models such as the psychiatric security review boards. Uh, we also added in language also to study uh, 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 guilty but mentally ill verdicts in, in criminal cases, uh, as those seem to have kind of risen to the top of uh, some of the discussions uh, around how the, some of this, from a mental health perspective, can address some of the, the concerns that uh, this bill originally sought to address. And so uh, we want to make sure and, and really do, you know, again, this is something that uh, when the Department of Mental Health says we'd like to study, uh, folks should sit up and take notice because we get asked to do a lot of studies and a lot of times and kind of get weary of studies. Uh, but we feel that like this is an extremely important topic that we want to be uh, judicious about and careful about. Uh, and um, my understanding from talking with other national experts uh, who, who have worked with other states around this topic uh, that uh, it's all too easy to have unintended consequences uh, in relation to the setup of things like the psychiatric security review board or adding uh, criminal verdicts of guilty but mentally ill, things of that sort. And so we wish to be able to study that. As part of that study, uh, it was uh, mentioned in my testimony uh, last week uh, that the department would uh, uh, suggest uh, the addition of having a, uh, an, an external uh, expert uh, slash consultant uh, be a part of the study, uh, and the department would also ask that uh, uh, that some uh, funds be attached uh, or requested uh, to be able to do that, so that we could have an expert come in to help us. Someone who is, uh, has national standards, uh, a national perspective, has worked with other states in, in these types of issues, uh, so that. We're not just having our own internal conversations, but that we actually have um, outside folks who have some expertise in this area that can help help guide some of those conversations. It's possible I'd have to look into that. I can't. Speak. I don't mind putting in appropriation. Just, you know, it's unusual for the the administration would support an additional appropriation. It would be difficult for us to have a. Uh, I think a robust study um, if we did not include uh, outside experts and I yeah. failed to see how to do that. Another question, and maybe, uh, maybe I'm missing it from the previous quickly. Uh, yep. Where's the victim's piece? There's a notification. Yep. Page five. All right, I just lost into the studies. Thank you. Yeah, and we didn't make any. <coughs> There was no real substantive changes to that other than uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Pepper from the state's attorneys had uh, suggested last time, which was the addition of the uh, uh, incompetent to stand trial. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. All uh, right. Yes. Well. The victim gets notified by the state's attorney if they so desire. Correct. And then this also uh, put in uh, uh, the attorney generals if they happen to be uh, the one prosecuting the case, as uh, Mr. Shear brought up uh, in last week's testimony as well. Okay. Um, um, James Pepper again, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we added, we asked specifically for Section 5, which is on page 6. That's the quote unquote Cheryl fix that allowed, that permits this, a state retained expert to examine um, a defendant for competency. Um, again, this would put these competency examinations on the exact same footing as the insanity evaluations, where the state can seek their own expert to evaluate a defendant. Um, we think that this is the most appropriate way to place to ch make the change. Um, we consulted with the attorney general's office, and we're in agreement that this just adds a section to the kind of discovery rules that allow, um, where it's a section right after the insanity evaluations, add one for competency evaluations. Other than that, um, you know, we, we looked at the um, 
some of the additions from the Department of Mental Health about adding party standing. We don't have any serious concerns about it at this time. We got them last night, and I just want to just reach out to a few more people. I know that the bill has a possible vote tomorrow, but um, I would If somebody's found incompetent to stand trial, what happens? Do they get competent enough to stand trial at some point? That's presumably. That's, that would be the intent and part of the study looks at uh, helping Vermont create a, uh, a competency restoration program. Because uh, as it stands right now, there is no legislative mandate to restore someone to competency. And so current practice is it's random, uh, to, you know, someone's uh, mental health treatment uh, and they no longer may require, say, inpatient level of care, that doesn't necessarily equal that they're now competent. And so, you know, we, we have that struggle. And um, I'm generally more familiar with the insanity plea than the, 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 that they lack competence to stand trial. I mean, usually until uh, the state attorney in Chicken County dropped those charge, those cases, mm -hmm. I think the competency uh, issue was really very often in here. It's usually been the insanity plea. Yeah. And in various cases, it, it can it can vary, uh, but in those cases in particular, you're correct. It, um, so, I'm sorry you're kind of caught off guard here. Did you did you and Moni want to testify together, or do you want to have anything to add? Or I, you know what? Did, this bill, I think, is a very good bill. Uh, I think that it, you know, the study committee in particular addresses all of the areas that the original bill was trying to address, but maybe in an insufficient or potentially unconstitutional way. Um, and so we're very much supportive of the kind of forensic study group, and we're, we hope that, um, you know, we can come back with a polished product for this committee to look at or the committee next door. Um, and with respect to the kind of other pieces of this, the victim notification, I mean, that's something that can happen immediately and, I, you know, in many cases should be happening, you know, by our perspective. And honestly, under the kind of some of the other provisions of the law, it seems like it should have been happening, but then it got interpreted differently um, by the Supreme Court. So I think that that is an incredibly important piece of this. Um, so. I don't have much to add. I think this make that section effective on passage. I look to the yeah. mental health just because they're the ones who would be notifying us to see if they could well, do it. In terms you know. of hearing from Jack McCullough or Matt Valerio, just put that out there. Yeah. So I was there aware of that. I mean, I'd have to check, but my current thought is I don't see what the barrier to that would be from our perspective. Um, it is limited to the big 12 crimes. Well, uh, no, I know. Yeah, it's, just, it's, yeah. I mean, uh, not to show the most people who are concerned. Right, of course. Uh, that, that's obviously the... the uh, obviously, uh, any crime is a right. serious thing if there's a victim. Any crime is serious. <laughs> any crime is serious. <laughs> Crimes where there are victims <coughs> identified more. are that much more serious and victims need to be taken into account in this process. God, get on TV saying crimes. Some crimes are not serious. <laughs> <laughs> We've been taught on saying worse things Well, I know, but I'm afraid that, you know, my opponent, know. we have an opponent who's going to be Vermont Senate and governor. He's running on a Republican ticket. Running for both? Mm -hmm. And huge. <coughs> He's also very outspoken about the amount of huge voter fraud in Bennington. So. Is this the guy with the dog on, the, on his thing? Oh, good no. Good no. He's one of yours. Yeah, but I have no idea who you're talking about. Mr. Hoyt. You'll become familiar with him when you have your. Now I know who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, great. I thank you all for working on this. Uh, David Sher, do you have any comments? Um, a few that are more in the, in the technical nature. Uh, if the committee wants to hear that now or some other time. No. Yeah, sure. All right. I mean, you're scheduled. Sounds good. Thanks, <laughs> Senator.
Yes, please. Can I make a comment after, at some point? We can put you in. Okay, next, great. Thank uh, you. If we have time. Okay. Today or tomorrow, Chris, you would also have Yes, to speak. if you have time. If we'll have time today or tomorrow for all of you. Mine is very short. So. Well, we're hopeful of that. <laughs> <laughs> Not kidding. Mine is we know you. We know you. And we're happy to hear from you. Good morning. I'm David Chair with the Attorney General's Office. Thanks for having me this morning. We uh, tried to do a very rapid review of this bill. I apologize. We didn't have a lot of time, but I had our criminal division look at it, and there were just a few things that they were uh, wanting to bring up. Some of them are actually current law issues, but they spotted in here, which, again, in those places where it mentions only state's attorneys, they would appreciate having the attorney general's office mentioned as well, since the AGO is often a uh, party in some of these cases, often a party in these cases. So, for example, on page two, uh, line 15, um, state's attorney without AGO is, is there. Um, moving on from that, one question that the criminal division had, and I, I apologize that I wasn't here for deputy, the deputy commissioner's testimony earlier. On the top of page four, I understand uh, Attorney McCullough is here too and may be able to answer this. They were, the criminal division was, our criminal division was wondering a little bit about the purpose of the Vermont Legal Aid Mental Health Law Project having party status at a hearing where the defendant would would presumably be represented by counsel. Understanding, of course, that they do represent folks in civil commitment hearings and just wondering what the uh, policy rationale was there. Um, our criminal division's view of that was that um, it's you know makes sense to the commissioner of mental health there, but with somebody who is currently represented um, by defense counsel, uh, and now also with the commissioner of mental health coming in with the clinical side of things, what the sort of policy rationale behind us what would seem to be giving the defendant a second um, sort of counsel this time employed by legal aid. And just trying to understand where that was coming from and what uh, policy end that was serving, again, given the context of this being a criminal uh, proceeding with uh, counsel already present. And uh, I assume that folks here in the room will be able to help us out with that. Um, the final thing that I'll bring up here was at the, actually near the end in the report, section there is on page on page eight there's a chunk that says the working group and this is on lines 13 through 17 working group it instructs the working group to do a sort of large survey which is entirely appropriate we are very much in favor of that um, but we were also the division our criminal division was also curious then if you skip ahead to page nine, the bottom of page nine, lines 19 to 21, there's a very specific directive about the Connecticut um, system. <clears throat> and it's not to say we take any position on that, whether Connecticut is good or bad, but we're just, it seemed a little bit unclear to have a sort of, let's do a broad survey, entirely appropriate, and then a seemingly specific directive to look at Connecticut. It may be that that's where we want to go. There's, again, no opposition. Well, there was a, quite but, a bit of testimony regarding how good Connecticut's model was, and so we wanted to make sure that that was reviewed. And that's totally fine. Could, we could be put in that frame of reference that, you know, we had some testimony about it. That's why I was there. But can I, I, I had, I didn't catch that before, but this very specifically says there will be legislation adapting that model. It doesn't say to study it and to look at it. It says there will be legislation, proposed legislation to adapt that, adopt that model. Yeah, I don't think we need to do that. Yeah, it should be over here in the study. Yeah. Of, yeah. Well, it's in the study also. Yeah, but, but you don't want it there, that's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, it shouldn't be there like that. You, you don't want it to say shall adopt it. Well, it's presuming the outcome of the study before yeah. the study is done. Right. Well, why would you even say anything? 
Yeah, just <laughs> if you were going to say something, maybe. If you were going to say something, well, maybe. Maybe you could say that Shell studied other states, right. including the Connecticut. Right. 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 In the study yeah. itself, over here. Yeah. High marks. Yeah. 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 But not presuming that you come to a conclusion. So That's right. Yeah. Also, part of that is proposed draft. Can you get Yeah, just take that sentence out. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would take that whole thing out. Okay. You Thank you. I didn't catch that. Yeah. And the only final thing. Huh? Did you want to take out the requirement to propose draft legislation altogether? I wanted to take out that whole. The, the report telling. connection. But are you I think they should the propose draft, draft legislation regarding changes. But right, but not, not that particular. particular. I just wanted to be clear. Oh. The whole yeah, thing. no, they can propose legislation if they want to. And the only final piece I'd mention is Attorney Pepper already testified to the uh, competency hearing piece, and we are uh, in agreement there and happy to answer any questions with anything else or that in the bill. Well, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, are you ready? Sure. Not malaria. Defender General um, took a look at this, had some questions as much as anything. Um, I wish I had my glasses as much as anything. Um, Do you want mine? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Readers, is that what you need? Yeah. 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 Um, I left them in my other coat. Wait, can you hear some? Oh, that one. Thank you. You're not like those. Threes or fours? No, or they're not. They're twos. Do they work? Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get around? <laughs> Would you like to try a different pair? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just, I'll figure it out at some point here. Um, you know, the biggest questions that we had about this had to do with bringing in, you use the word parties a lot in this, and you, you talk about the, we have a criminal matter pending, and probably somebody's already gone through this, or at least looked at this issue, and usually the parties are the state and the defendant, and I just didn't know if, you know, if the commissioner and mental health is also going to be a criminal defendant party or maybe the maybe legal aid also what is party what do you mean by parties in in this is it you know the, what does party status uh, mean when it when you're talking about that, I'm gonna ask mental the health commissioner, in, in a the criminal commissioner case. or the state's attorneys to respond to that question they might be interested parties in some way and have a legal position to put forward, but I don't think that they rise to the level of parties in a criminal matter. Uh, it confuses me. I just don't know what that what that means. What rights do you I'm get? So, Pepper, you want well, this this actually came from the Department of Mental Health. So. <laughs> so, I think uh, the Department of Mental Health's concern is that there are times when with when competency or sanity are raised, with being contemplated of putting someone into the commissioner's custody. And so therefore, we do have an interest in, we have before, um, in several cases, we disagreed with what has happened. You know, they're, they're making decisions to put people in our custody without, without getting our opinion, our clinical opinion on it. And so what the department is really seeking is to be at the table to get the reports, to have the opportunity to present to the court our concerns or our recommendations. I think however you want to phrase that, I think that's what we're getting at, is that we would like to be at the table and we would like our clinical rationale uh, to be heard by the judge to be considered in the case when thinking about committing someone into our custody. There's some other terminology other than party status open to that. That's the intent. To me, they sound like witnesses. 
almost. I mean, if they're going to be presenting a clinical opinion that is contrary to, then they should be subject to cross-examination and uh, examination under oath, just like any other witness. If they have a um, if they have a position that's based. I'm asked, I kind of asked the same question. I, I understand what their role is after the criminal case is over, and that doesn't, doesn't bother me. And I actually, we've talked over the years about um, when we get to the point of the hospitalization or non-hospitalization hearing, we've, we've spoken before about having uh, the legal aid, uh, legal aid pick up the case at that point. They um, do more work with the Department of Mental Health as far as the therapeutic end than the Defender General's office does. And you know, they have, they have more expertise in that. I mean, there's individuals within the DG's office who are as good as anybody, but I can't guarantee that you know, any attorney representing anybody all over the state who might have a mental health uh, so defense case. So what is the case. Department of Children and Families role in cases, for example, of where you're determining whether to place a child in custody, how does that work? Is there, aren't they a party to that or no? Well, the state is the party. So it's not DCF versus... But DCF is there. Yeah, and they, and they put social workers or people on the stand and you can cross-examine them and ask them questions and test their opinion as to why they're uh, recommending what they're recommending. Um, you know, the state is the party that they are... I don't think they're parties. They're, they're just they're witnesses. Um, you know, party status to me raises other issues. Um, and, and I actually don't know how it would even, how it would even work. Um, did this, I have, a lot, I have questions about this more than I had various issues. When you were early on in the proceeding, and it's the, the beginning of the bill, does this, on page two, and I have a note on beginning on page three, are you, is this proposing that in every case where there's a mental health uh, issue, that competency and sanity evaluations be done immediately at the same time? We talked about that. We'll be proposing some changes. Okay. Because it, you described that? Yeah. Um, it, read, it read that way to me, and they're really very Well, distinct. Joe, uh, Senator Benning brought it up, and nice to see you both on the same page. And we didn't even talk to each other. I was with Pepper, too. I mean, we were all in agreement. The idea here is that the it's a sequencing of uh, when the competency and the insanity evaluations take place in particular cases. And that was uh, not as clear in the draft. So the, I don't know if you have a pen or want to add this, but the way the proposed change to it is, so you're on the bottom of page 2, line 17. Yeah, right. So it only would apply in situations where, so if, read it, if the psychiatrist or psychologist has been asked to provide opinions as to both, both the, the person's competency and sanity at the time of the event. So in situations where they've been asked to provide opinions as to both, um, then the sequencing kicks in. So then the opinion shall be presented in separate reports and addressed separately. And then to start the second sentence by saying, in such cases, the examination of the sanity shall be undertaken if the competency formulation is done. So when they're asked to do both, um, the, they're separate, and um, that's the sequence that they go on. That's the idea. What, what is the purpose of that? You need to ask the department that. I, the purpose around separating uh, the competency and sanity evaluations, is that your question? Well, I, it sounds like you're almost combining them as opposed to separating them. The, the language See, that uh, Vice Council mentions uh, should be should be basically saying that 
when the court orders both competency and sanity, competency evaluation shall take place first before we do an evaluation for sanity. In cases where just competency or just sanity is ordered, you will do just competency or just sanity. And the idea is that if you're found not competent, that you don't do the sanity exam until you've been found competent. Right. Um, just so that everybody's aware, you can raise their, you have a period of time to raise sanity. Um, you don't have to do that immediately at the very beginning of the case. Um, sanity is a defense that can be raised only with the consent of the defendant, assuming that he's competent to stand trial or she. And um, so sometimes what it takes is the gathering of information that you don't have at the very beginning of the case. So just so that you're aware, the timing of, of this, it, it's not neat like this. And the way some of the clients uh, um, address these issues, because you, you might be competent, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're well. Um, and making a decision about whether or not you want to raise a sanity defense can sometimes come and go. Um, and um, if you want to tie it with a bow early on in a, in a, in a kind of easy procedure, um, that's probably not going to work. Uh, but I can see, you know, if there are enough if, if, ifs, if this happens, then this happens, if this happens, then this, that's fine. But that's not often the way that it happens. Um, I had already talked about before the, the notice issue regarding uh, uh, victims, and we have no, no problem with that. Now we see it in a draft, and it's worthwhile. Um, I, I'm running this by our appellate division. They, between last night and this morning, I haven't seen any of them. Um, but if you go to page, uh, page six and seven, and particularly page seven involving um, treating a sanity examination like a non-testimonial order. It's in that kind of same section. Uh, medical inspections, handwriting samples, blah, 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 rule 16.1. Um, I think that there might be constitutional prohibitions against compelling somebody to have a uh, sanity evaluation um, or, or an order. I, I mean, I actually think they have a constitutional right to refuse to be examined um, if they decide that that's what they want to do. Um, and I know that this, this may arise out of some cases that have occurred in the last couple of years. Um, where the state was seeking evaluations of the defendant in cases where mental health issues were raised, um, but there was no authority uh, to do that. Um, but I think the reason there is no authority to do that is you probably have Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights um, not to, that you don't have to participate in those. Um, evaluations. So I don't know. You, you, I don't think you can statutorily overcome not those. Well, not the part that's not on page seven that's underlined in yellow and. Well, it's similar to what's on the bottom of page six. I think the existing law permits the ordering of uh, an insanity. When the defendant raises insanity as a defense, they can order the examination. So the proposal is to allow it for competency as well. Allows it to what? Competency. <laughs> My, 
These students are from Mount Anthony. Well, so great. Cheers. Welcome to the Senate Judiciary. Thanks for being here. Here's the chair of Senate Judiciary. So I hope you have a great time. Thank you. And, um, and I hope you get a picture with you later. Climb up on I hope so too, but I don't need that. Excuse me. Um, unfortunately, we have a crowded room here. So welcome. Uh, That's all right. It's not really going to go anywhere. I mean, wait for it. I'm Dick Sears, chair of the committee, and we're talking about the, about insanity pleas and uh, when people are deemed to be not guilty by reason of insanity or are not competent to stand trial and changes that might be made in that particular law. So, welcome. See you. What do we got here? Why don't I nap? Uh, Teresa Snyder. Oh, Gahan and Dominique Thies. Welcome. Any guys go to school there? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they should no. be fun. Some of them are, you know, they're all, they're, you know. Same thing happens with Mike. School goes somewhere. Oh. All the girls go, none of the guys show up. <laughs> oh, my, my male students are in another committee meeting. I do have males here, though. Oh, well, good. Yes. <laughs> Where are they? They're, I don't know what committee they're in. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, what I'd like to do well, is get... lucky to have you four. And five, five. With each. You're the a teacher at yes, I Anthony. Okay. On this, on this, this is the Defender General, so... You ever hear of me? I hope you never meet me. <laughs> but if you do, it's all right. <laughs> um, I'd like to get back to you on the cost this constitutional issue. I, I wanted to run it by. I, like I said, I just I sent it over to appellate, and you know. I, well, we're going to take it up tomorrow. I, I think I'll have something for you by then. Okay. Um, the, uh, and I actually, I noted the same things regarding sort of the directive language on Connecticut. I don't know what's so special about Connecticut. You were taking that out. were here. Yeah, I was here. I saw that. But um, okay. the, what, I do, what I do know about Connecticut is they're good every five to ten years um, where they create great systems. And then by year seven, they don't fund them. And then there's a lawsuit. And then they get a whole ton of money, and then it's great again for another three to five years, and then they don't fund it, and then there's another lawsuit. That um, can be true about the law. Well, you know, we try to get along here. You know. <laughs> um, that's what I have. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thanks for the glass of Lucy. That puts you up next. <laughs> Lucy Garland from representing. I did want to say that if, in the event that legal aid does want to, if somebody is declared um, incompetent or insane at the time, and we get to the hospitalization uh, hearing, if legal aid, and we've talked about this before, if they want to pick up the representation at that time for purposes of the hospitalization hearing, uh, I've said it before and I'll say it here just so we're clear, I, I don't, we don't object to that. Well, Jack will be testifying tomorrow. So, Lucy Garen, DRM, I will be very short. Um, on page eight with the work group, we're hoping to add a representative of the designated hospitals to the work group appointed by Boz. By who? The Hospital Association. Oh. So, there are five designated hospitals in the state. Um, so we just would like a seat at the table. No. Um, UVM Medical Center, CVMC, the Retreat, Springfield. Um, so. Well, they have the Wyndham Center. Well, but not the Wyndham Center. Not anymore. Not anymore. Yeah. Oh, they're not bankrupt anymore? Well, no, they may be bankrupt, but they're not a designated hospital. Oh, I think oh, the morning so can tell you. Wouldn't say they're no longer. Oh, as of January 1. Oh, as of January 1. Okay. So it doesn't exist at all, or did somebody it, take it, it over? It exists. The Wyndham Center still yeah. exists. They're still taking uh, uh, psychiatric patients, just voluntary in nature. Yeah, not involuntary. They, they voluntarily chose as of January 1. 
not to seek redesignation while they're going through their kind of whole process with Springfield Hospital. It's possible in the future that may change, but right now they're not currently designated for involuntary psychiatric patients. But they're still under the auspices of Springfield Hospital? Yes. Okay. And the VA hospital is also the VA. Oh, the VA, yes. Could you repeat yeah. the language, Lucia? Uh, so a representative of designated hospitals appointed by the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Benno represents the victims of crime. And I, too, will be very Sure. <laughs> Why well, just so all of you from the audience may know that you also have representatives for if you should become a victim of a crime. Thank you, Senator Sears. Chris Fenno from the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. Um, the o only question I had, and Pepper may actually have an answer for this, is that. I, I would like the state's attorneys in the AG's office to have a, a policy and procedure around notifying victims. And I would suggest that rather than opting in, that they opt out so that it's incumbent on somebody to try to notify the victim um, if they have not opted out of notification. Maybe actually, you know, I dealt Saturday morning with a family member of the victim of a murder. The, the, murder, the murderer escaped from Carrillo and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Bellows Falls. And, uh, he uh, murdered a young man from Bennington in 1987. And his brother still lives in Shaftesbury and wasn't notified that the guy had absconded. And it's like, the, it's, a, it's a long story of Carrillo failures, but to make a long story short, the, the fact is that they evidently had been confused about signing up for the <clears throat> victim notification, and so they weren't. Um, the, the victim's wife was notified, but the brother wasn't. Mm -hmm. There's this kind of confusion about that, so it might be, mm -hmm. I, I think that's probably a good idea. Um, and I will say this for your state attorneyship, more than willing to help get him signed up. I called Tracy about it because uh, it happened in Bellows mm -hmm. Falls. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, so I think that's. Exactly, they picked him up. Uh, it's a they got him this morning about. Up, yeah. I got an email Where? from no. Rutland. In Rutland? Okay. <clears throat> so that's my only recommendation is an opt out rather than an opt in. <clears throat> Because then I think it will give it some importance. Things just, you know, years later. And I just think that every attempt should be made uh, to notify victims. If they want to. If, well. I would see. <laughs> if they I don't opt out. I had a long conversation. I mean, this, this guy had a number. We also talked about expunging his record. So it was more than just, you know, but. In talking with him, he said, every time this happens and we hear about it, that's re-victimizing us, mm -hmm. we, we then get reminded of all that. So there may be victims who don't wish to be notified. And then right. they would opt out. And then they would opt out. Right. Um, and we actually, we were talking about this in the office, and we have two long-time employees who actually victims call them. They, they were so sort of paranoid that they didn't even want to sign up for the victim notification uh, automatic one. Um, but, you know, 15 years later, they're still checking in um, with our staff because they're worried that people are going to get out. Okay. Any That's questions? Okay. Any okay. Well, <coughs> adding there? Yep. We've got some extra time. Uh, are you ready today, Jack, or do you want to wait till tomorrow? I was going to talk to Karen Barber about one of the things, so it might be better for me to wait till tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Right. You go. Judge Grierson, if you're ready, sure. We can. I never thought we'd get to you today. Neither did I. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Anyway. <clears throat> Good morning. 
the record, Brian Grierson, uh, Chief Superior Judge, speaking to revised uh, draft 4.1, uh, 183. Um, section 1, I'm looking at uh, the line, uh, line 16. Commissioners shall be a party when issues of competency or sanity are raised. Um, I had a chance to at least get this out to the judges, a, a quick response, and in my view, and, and we've discussed this before in other committees, is that I think it's appropriate, not when the issue is raised, um, but once there has been a competency determination, if the individual is found to be uh, incompetent, the next step is the hospitalization, or I think you referred to it here as commitment hearing regarding commitment, so it's a hospitalization or non-hospitalization hearing. And uh, there was a study commission, I want to say two, maybe two or three sessions ago, uh, involving all the folks that have been testifying here, and I, my recollection was that there was consensus that at that stage, at the hospitalization uh, hearing or non-hospitalization hearing, that it made sense to then bring in the Department of Mental Health uh, as a party, as well as uh, legal aid and the primary thinking at least my recollection was that at the competency stage it's still clearly a question of public safety um, and, and criminal behavior if you determine if the determination is that the individual is incompetent to stand trial then at least at that point the focus turns to not punishment um, but uh, treatment and I think both legal aid and the Department of Mental Health are better informed at that stage as to what is, what is necessary. I think um, the the last I forget the bill number. I don't know if you found it, Eric, but um, that provision actually went through in a bill form through the House, and I believe it came here. I don't know that we ever had a hearing in, in front of Senate Judiciary. Um, but it may be one way of resolving what I think was a concern by the state's attorneys uh, was to leave the state's attorney at the table at the hospitalization hearing, but still allow uh, DMH and the attorney general's office to come in uh, and they could work together at that point. But I think it would be important to bring in uh, Jack McCullough and, and folks from his order. Those are the folks that if it, once it's in the civil forum, they're the ones that are going to be involved anyway. So um, I agree with the concept, but I think it's later, at a later stage, that it would be appropriate. Um, under Section 2, uh, I'm standing correctly, Judge. At a later stage, where the bill does actually make DMH and legal aid parties at the top of page 4, this is the, the commitment hearing stage, I think. Mean. If I'm hearing you right, you're saying that's the appropriate time for them to be a party. Yes. Um, yes. Both, as far as section one, I think you guys have to think about what that what that language might read. I think there was some concern expressed by the defender general about what the party's wording means in that context as well. So maybe that's a way to either keep it in that place or tweak it a little bit to I'm sorry, talk about I notice and an opportunity to be heard, maybe. Or, or something, or strike it and just keep it in the later piece on the top page. Yeah, most of the that makes sense. Most of the issues, of Eric. I'll be glad to talk to the DMH. Track most of your issues. Thanks. Um, they clearly should be involved at that hospitalization hearing as parties. As to what notice, uh, it, it may be a matter of getting notice of the earlier proceedings and not necessarily party status. So that may be may be one way of resolving that. That's what Matt was saying too. Um, so section two, the current statute um, seems to require that the psychiatrist conduct every examination and that an examination by a psychologist be included when the defendant has a developmental disability. Feel free to take a seat. Seat open up. Feel free to take a place. <laughs> I think it's a matter really of clarifying um, is it just the psychologist or do they intend that a psychiatrist should be involved in every evaluation and then only bring in psychologists? Um, 
when there's a developmental disability. Where is that on? Um, I'm in section two. Oh, on line seven? Yeah. And this is all, of course, this is the current law. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So uh, one of the uh, judges just raised the question of does that mean that in every case there is a psychiatrist and only uh, bring in a psychologist uh, when there are cases involving developmental disability or if it is a case identified as developmental disability, a psychiatrist still have to be involved. And so I think it's more a matter of clarification than anything else. And again, I'll be glad to talk with folks from DMH okay. on that. And on section three, uh, we have no, uh, no comment. It makes sense. agree with section four that notice uh, should be required <coughs> when the person is discharged we have no objection to that and we have no comments on um, uh, section five I'm sorry again we have no uh, objection section five And they have no comments with respect to section six or seven. Uh, one matter that's not uh, uh, part of the bill that has occurred, at least brought to my attention recently, when uh, individuals are found incompetent and we move to the next phase, other than in extremely serious uh, violent offenses, most of those cases are dismissed without prejudice at that stage, and then they go to the civil process. We discovered recently that at least in one uh, county, and I don't know how widespread it is, and I'm looking into it, that they have left those cases open um, without dismissing them, sometimes for 10 years or more, uh, which raises all kinds of questions about the conditions of release that may have been imposed mm -hmm long time ago, and so the, the thought was that there ought to be some consideration to um, when the case should be, um, how long does the case stay open, and if we're going to be talking about restoration services, uh, you, you probably wouldn't want to dismiss it, but the question is how long should a case remain open, um, and so we would suggest the committee may want to consider that as they, as they move forward. Well, we can take this up tomorrow, and then my plan would be to vote it out on Tuesday, markup, final markup Tuesday, along with the robocall bill, which most people are, we have not yet heard from the robocall industry, but they don't want to testify. So, um, so Tuesday, we, we should be ready to mark it up, and I hope that everybody will have any suggestions, and by then it gives you the whole weekend after tomorrow's testimony. And that's so all I right. think this bill would go to health and welfare or at least they would look at it, and then maybe appropriations. If you, if you have language on that appropriation to have an outside person. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Unless somebody else wants to testify on this bill, I think we're, we're going to take a, one, a lengthy break to 10.30. Oh, so if everybody can be back right Yes, Mr. Um, could I just make one brief comment? Absolutely, and stay right there. Okay. And um, and the Penguin Street yeah, for Disability people. Rights for Mom. Let the people at Mount Anthony know that you have a Bennington Connection. I have a Bennington Connection. Heck. 
I was born there, grew up in Shaftesbury, graduated from Mount Anthony Union High School in the first class to actually go through four years there. So it's my own stomping grounds, as they say. You look like an original alumni. Oh, most affirmed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would just make the comment in the section on studying forensic needs that the state's mental health care ombudsman ought to be included there, and that's the state's protection and advocacy system, which is disability rights for mine. Uh, 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 I think nobody, is there any objection to that? Uh, thank you. Thanks for that advertisement from Bill Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll take a break till 10.30, but be back at 10.30 to talk about